to take off from, yes? So you have to move back a little. If, are we supposed to look at the moment? Yeah, but I will move when oh, okay. it's time. That's very good. <laughs> Last time I uh, had an, I didn't have a real title for my uh, section, but this time I've decided I do have a title. This is the age of the John Henrys. And you'll find out just about everyone I talk about. Name is John Henry. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. This is the, or in the age of the John Henrys. This is, uh, we, we went up to the revolution last time, and uh, let me review uh, what I tried to do last time, just for a minute. My thesis that's carrying me through the three weeks is, that, is the way in which the Anglican Church, first the, the Church of England established in the American colonies, and then after the revolution, the Episcopal Protestant Church, Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States, uh, both were, uh, in interesting ways, at odds with the mainstream of American history. And being at odds with the mainstream of American history um, has been a major uh, theme of the interrelationship, or the, rather the general historical development of the Episcopal Church in the United States. And uh, I had some, some contrasting pairs, if you will, uh, and I had it all nicely done, but they erased it, so. <laughs> I'm just going to do the, the pairs that I'm going to look at. Um, we, remember that, we remember that last time, for example, the probably the most significant pairing, the contrasting pairing, was the fact that the Episcopal Church, by and large, was opposed to the American Revolution. So that's a classic example of the Episcopal Church, or the Anglicanism, being at odds with the mainstream of American history. The mainstream of American history goes revolutionary, and the rest of the, the most of the Episcopal Church is not ready to go revolutionary. So we had, uh, you know, um, this is going to work. Well, it isn't very impressive. for the trend in a new kind of pol abolitionist politics in the North, particularly, and in the West, and the church remaining um, aloof from that. Uh, after the Civil War, in particular, you have two other tendencies. Uh, one is the USA going towards uh, uh, the next moral movement in society, a great movement, prohibition, and uh, this is where the typical church is, you know, Non-intervention. We haven't been very strong on prohibition. <laughs> um, and then um, finally, I want to talk about um, colleges <coughs> and high schools. And I'll explain what I mean by that later. And I think there's a wider meaning to these these pairings that I hope to uh, use to explain larger themes. <clears throat> the theme for today, and the important theme for the period after the revolution, is the relationship between the church and society. Because the American society is changing dramatically, as you know, after the revolution in the next uh, 
century and, um, and the relationship the Anglican Church to those changes and to American growth is, is the critical issue of this period of history. Let me just get to that point by recovering now what has happened to the church institutionally after the revolution. We, we got to the point last time where they had a, um, they've had to become an independent denomination. They recognized, at least the Southerners did, in their statement that I gave last time that, well, we're just another of many denominations. And so they put the word Protestant Episcopal Church to emphasize the fact that they are a Protestant denomination like many others. And the statement is uh, that, that I quoted, emphasizes the fact that we're one of many Protestant denominations. It's important for us to be good partners with them or, you know, cooperate with them if the time is important. We're all Christians together. There's a kind of a, there's a kind of a, reaching out uh, in that period. Uh, they knew they were a tiny minority uh, with no privileged status any longer. And so uh, there was a new humility, I think, in the, some of the statements in that period. Anyway, the, the, then the, the, they turned to the uh, job of rebuilding the church. Now, we also recall from last time that there was a big difference between the northern Episcopalians because they were um, largely created by a society for the propagation of the gospel of missionaries. They were funded from England. They were um, missionaries. They were true believers. They uh, were strong Anglicans. They tended to have a higher interpretation of bishops and of the importance of the church than the uh, comfortably established and aristocratically dominated southern church which was more easygoing in its theology and its attitude towards bishops and of that nature. And you'll see that, that that difference that we talked about last time has a role to play in how the church is rebuilt. Um, each of the, you know, the northern kind of branch of the uh, Episcopal Church and then the southern branch of the Episcopal Church each tried to reestablish the church. Uh, almost independently uh, at, right after the revolution because they had different ideas about what the new church should look like. And uh, Maryland was the first to organize itself as a new self-sustaining and self-governing body you know, after it had been dis disestablished um, and most of its clergy had left. Yeah, we talked about all that last time. Um, and uh, it was the first to reestablish itself as a kind of an, a voluntary church with its own self-governing body, uh, convention, and its own little constitution, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and, um, and also the concept, although not quite the reality, of having its own bishop. And this idea was then approved formally by the Maryland legislature, so it, was, it had stamp of approval, legal approval. It was the first state to uh, get that far. And uh, it was William White. Now, he's one of the, not one of the John Hendricks. He's the exception. He's William. Uh, William White uh, was a vicar, the rector, actually, of Christ Church in uh, Philadelphia. And he also served as the chaplain to the Continental Congress um, during the Revolution. So he was one of the few, or one of the minority, rather, of Anglican uh, priests that stayed true to the Revolution. And... Um, that helped him have a certain amount of prestige in the post-revolutionary period. He um, adopted or tried to uh, go further and take this Maryland idea and make it the foundation of the whole church. He called together a convention. This is, of course, in 1786, I think. Um, he called a, con a convention of all the southern and mid-Atlantic uh, churches to get uh, priests together to try to form themselves into a new denomination on the Maryland model. And that would mean, uh, essentially, the convention decided that they would have uh, a unicameral convention with lay people and clergy meeting, although they would vote separately as different bodies, and keep, keep a little bit of a separation between the ordained clergy and the uh, lay people. Nevertheless, it was going to be a combined convention, and uh, um, and they were going to um, they were going to try to get a bishop for each state convention, and then have a general convention uh, also on the same model. That was the idea. 
And of course, this was, uh, in a sense, a democratic church. It was going to be lay people. It's going to be a kind of a representative body, uh, like a Congress, uh, that was going to ultimately govern the church. Now, the Northerners, who uh, really emphasized the hierarchy and importance of bishops, uh, did not like this arrangement of having lay people as part of the governing body of the church, and they rejected this plan. <coughs> they could brag, the Northerners could brag, that they had the only bishop in America, Samuel Seabury. And uh, in fact, Samuel Seabury signed his letter to Bishop of All America. <laughs> um, and uh, so um, they met with Seabury, the, the Northern uh, New England uh, clergy met with Seabury and uh, organized their church, their convention on completely different grounds for the, under the sole authority of the um, clergy without lay, lay government at all. Um, <coughs> now, Seabury was a bishop kind of by the back door. The English parliament would not, yet, was not ready to um, consecrate bishops for America. This is a problem that we talked about again last time, about bishops for the colonies. The problem now was, of course, that uh, the canon stated, law stated in England that any bishop had to swear an oath of allegiance to the king, and how do you do that when you have an American citizen wanting to be a bishop? So they had legal problems to overcome. Uh, also, in Seabury's case, um, they had to negotiate <coughs> well, he couldn't be consecrated because he was not formally recognized by his government, that is, the state of Massachusetts. So uh, he had all sorts of problems trying to convince uh, Parliament to, to and the church and ultimately Parliament, which is in control of the church, to uh, approve his consecration as a bishop. So what he did is he went to Scotland where there were a bunch of what are called non-juring Episcopalians. These are kind of illegal Episcopalian bishops. <laughs> this goes back to uh, this goes back to 1688 when there was a revolution where they threw out their king. His name was uh, James II. It was called the Glorious Revolution because nobody died. They got rid of their king without any death. Um, <laughs> it's quite a glorious revolution. He, James II had tried to convert England to Catholicism, and so he, they got rid of him. But some of the Episcopal bishops who really, really believe in hierarchy and authority, really, really, really do, um, would not accept that the king had been overthrown. They thought it was illegitimate. And so when Parliament uh, made this happen, legally speaking, they, uh, they were non-juring. They wouldn't sign on. They wouldn't sign an oath of allegiance to the new queen and king, William and Mary. So uh, there were all these illegal bishops, you know, non-juring bishops uh, around, and so that's where Seabury got his consecration from them. So I think you kind of get it illegally um, in a way. Um, well, it was William White, again, who himself was uh, consecrated a bishop finally when the parliament made the right changes and uh, Bish uh, Williams and uh, William White and two others were consecrated bishops legally, normally through the English Episcopacy um, in eight, in a few years later in 1786, seven, I can't remember the dates on that, late 80s. Um, so it was Bishop now White who um, saved the day by calling together Seabury, the Northerners, down to with the Southerners, get them together and strike a compromise deal. And of course you can imagine what the compromise is going to be like. It's a, it's going to be, yes, they're going to be lay people in convention, but the, the House of Bishops is going to meet separately from uh, the, uh, the general convention, and that the House of Bishops is going to have a veto over, uh, it's going to have a veto with uh, an overriding vote only possible at four-fifths, four-fifths of the convention. That's a lot. And then in later, in 1808, they just eliminated the, the override. <laughs> so the House of Bishops, had strong power with a total veto over anything that the convention would do. So there's a there's there's the compromise. The lay people are there. That's the southern position, the democratic position, and the, the House of Bishops has a complete veto. That's the northern position. So everyone's happy, and the church is united under a single convention. 
All right, now let me turn now to uh, the relationship of church and society and these three contrasts. Uh, you know that after the American Revolution, America entered on an age of great expansion, immigration, the growth of wealth and industry, and of course the Western movement. Uh, the northern expansion, that is, you know, the Western movement in the north, started with Western New York and Pennsylvania and Ohio, was marked by that, you know, that pioneer, intrepid pioneer family, the Yankee pioneer families, establishing farms and small industries as they moved west. <clears throat> and uh, at this group, these areas, particularly Western New York and early 19th century, Western New York was called the burned over district because the wave after wave, wildfire of revival movements would sweep through periodically. I mean, this was, these, these were the people that were influenced by the revival movement, <coughs> and revival would come in waves like fire and it get burned over after a while. Um, this is where, for example, Mormonism got started. I mean, there's a lot of, of, of religious revivalistic activity going on. Um, this was America as it grew and expanded westward, and the Episcopalians generally weren't there. Uh, they didn't play a part in, the, uh, in that great revivalistic uh, tendency. The southern expansion was characterized by the same intrepid pioneer families and small farmers, but also by the expansion of the extremely prosperous tobacco and cotton plantations worked by slaves, so slavery moved west too. Uh, on the, in the southern part of the country, there's kind of a dual movement, <coughs> expansion. What, I, what, I, what, what you have to understand with the coming of the Civil War is you have not the conflict between the dynamic and expanding north and the more of an old fashioned aristocratic south and a dying slave system that was doomed to failure anyway. You have two very dynamic societies, both expanding, both on different bases one on the basis of slave agriculture and the other on the basis of uh, small, independent farmers and indus, uh, in, in dis businesses. And those two systems of what we call political economy are incompatible. And they start clashing as they come into connection in the West. I mean, the, you know, the conflicts over the slavery flare up in places like Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri, uh, places where those two expanding societies are going to be um, competing with each other. Um, in the meantime, well, one should recognize, first of all, that the Episcopal Church, depleted as it was with resources and, and clergy after the revolution, was in a poor position to, to play a big role in this expansion, to expand with the Western movement and the, and the growth of, the Amer of America generally had to spend a lot of their effort just rebuilding their church right on the eastern seaboard where they were, it used to be. Uh, that was one problem for the church. Um, they also uh, tended to stand aloof from revivalism, which alienated them from a lot of uh, people, the common people of the uh, Western movement and so forth. Um, but I should say, um, nevertheless, that there were many Episcopalians active in building Church, and they often, uh, often uh, were uh, of a more revivalistic tendency or evangelical tendency. There were a growing number of, of uh, evangelicals in the Episcopal Church. And they were, they were acting like other evangelicals, but they were moving out west, they were forming mission churches, they were preaching, uh, they were building new institutions like colleges and seminaries uh, in the west. And perhaps the most famous case is a man by the name of Philander Chase. I don't know where he got that name. Uh, you know, we think of philanderer, which means, you know, love of man. Philander. Uh, what we associate that with bad sexual behavior. But in those days, it didn't have that connotation. So, and his name Chase, boy, I don't know. Philander Chase was a tireless missionary and founder of schools in Ohio and then Illinois. He was the first bishop of Illinois. Uh, he founded Kenyon College in Ohio and uh, a related seminary called Betchley House in 1824. And uh, he was a tireless opponent of Catholicism. He was a strong evangelical. And he really was angry at the, what he considered to be 
Catholic tendencies in the Episcopal Church, and he created a lot of storm inside the church and was disliked by many Episcopalians in his own communion. Uh, but he was out there in the West, you know, uh, left the East undisturbed at least for a while. But he was a presiding bishop uh, for a while because the presiding bishop was the <coughs> oldest bishop, the longest serving bishop. So that was the way it worked. And so unfortunately, a lot of people got mad because he ended up being the presiding bishop and they didn't like him at all. <laughs> One was uh, another example of an activist bishop in this time role with a very different model. Is about, here's our first John Henry, John Henry Hobart. Uh, he was the bishop of New York starting in 1811. And he, uh, again, gave a very influential and activist model of what a bishop should be, although very different from Chase. He was one of the first to practice direct and regular oversight of his diocese by visitation and by regular uh, letters, uh, uh, letters from the bishop to his uh, clergy and to his people, pastoral letters. He uh, supported mission efforts in the western New York, uh, but when he did, he, he wasn't going as an evangelical. His people weren't going as evangelicals, they were going to build solid, rational, well-ordered liturgical churches, and, and they emphasized the difference between their church and these kind of emotional revivalistic churches that were typical of the era. Uh, Hobart is a, a champion of the high church in his day. He has his own seminary, general seminary, in uh, New York, and he quickly, uh, uh, we, when we say high church, we uh, associate that with ritual. Uh, we associate that with altar boys and surplices and uh, priests and Cossacks and candles and smells and bells. Actually, much of that kind of thing came um, into use in the 1840s and 50s. That's, that's what, we didn't do that before the 1840s and 50s. It was part of a movement called the Cambridge, started by the Cambridge University Cambridge Society, which when they went out and they found that practices in the, in the Church of England churches in England were very poor and very inconsistent and they found people standing on altars during the service to open windows and, 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 the, and, and, and altars that were um, uh, in the wrong places and, and it just was really a bad, bad show. And so they reformed, um, um, they reformed uh, practice to give it regularity and dignity, and this really caught on. And, uh, uh, but that was associated not only with the high church, but also with the evangelicals who also in the mid <coughs> adopted a lot of that uh, dignified worship service, even with an evangelical-minded um, theology. So what really defines high church is not <coughs> just the show and tell of, of the service, but really, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the ideology or the, the theology behind what the high church is. And that is the, the emphasis on the sufficiency of the church in all important matters of life. Uh, that salvation was attained through the agency of baptismal renewal uh, and regular Eucharist. The, you know, the, the focus on the order of the church life as being central. Um, salvation was obtained through the agency of, I, I just said that, I repeated myself, and, um, and the importance, of course, when you're emphasizing sacraments is uh, the importance of the priesthood, well ordered in this apostolic succession. Instead of emphasis on preaching, like the revivalists, um, there's an emphasis on the liturgical service and the, and the sacraments. The um, ecclesiastical focus precluded cooperation with other churches. Hobart said, I just do not recognize the legitimacy of non-Episcopal churches. It's, it's not, this is in contrast to the, you know, the evangelical mind, the, the Episcopalians who say, you know, we're just one of, many, we're, all us Protestants are kind of alike. We have, you know, the same kind of mission in the world, but not the high church. The high church says, no, I just do not recognize the legitimacy because Again, if the sacraments are the important thing, then the, uh, the, the correct training of the priesthood and the, and the apostolic succession, which is the correct uh, order of authority, is critical. And therefore, the other churches are not legitimate. Um, 
Hobart refused to let his clergy participate in benevolent organizations with non-apostolic churches. No cooperation. And he also formed, uh, you know, for example, one of the great uh, uh, voluntary societies was the Bible Society, you know, to spread the Bible, you know, uh, wherever it could go. And uh, he would participate in such groups. He had to own, form his own Bible Society, an Episcopal Bible System, etc. Along that. And uh, he wouldn't, uh, he, he would not allow his clergy or his churches or his uh, parishioners to engage in politics. Um, he wanted the church to stay free and uh, superior to the, 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 the rumble and tumble of, uh, of political life, a particular political life dominated by non-apostolic churches and church people as, as it was in America. He called upon his church clergy to stay out of civil government and he himself refused to vote. That's what I mean by self-sufficiency of the church. The church is really the important thing. Um, the relationship between church and society is not critical, therefore. The, the church doesn't make its influence felt by going out in society and changing society. It's more like the church is a refuge uh, than, than it is a, a source of reform for society. That was the old high church in the early 19th century. Hobart was a champion that was very popular among many uh, Episcopal clergy. Uh, this was reinforced, I, I should say, remember how uh, I emphasized the fact that it was evangelicalism and revivalism started in the Church of England begin, uh, in the originally. So the Church of England brought you revivalism, and now it's going to bring you the opposite, uh, neo-Catholicism, neo if you will. And this is called, the, uh, this is what is the Oxford Movement, which starts in the 1830s in England. And this movement reinforces the, the old high church attitude of the importance of the church. And, and bishoprics and the sacraments. This movement was associated with well, our second John Henry, John Henry Newman, who you may have heard of because he's, he's a favorite among Catholics because he later converted to Catholicism. Um, that's how neo-Catholic his movement was. Uh, many eventually went to Catholicism. Um, the Oxford movement strongly reinforced the high church position with new theological emphasis on the mystery of the sacraments, the importance of the one historic church, uh, and, the, and, the, and the church fathers. And um, this is tied, this movement is tied to the romantic response to middle class rationalism and the political economy of it. It's the kind of the, you know, England is in the Industrial Revolution. And you have a new middle class growing up, which is rationalist in the sense of business. Business mentality really secular-minded, prophets, you know, um, and, um, and respectability, and all those things that the middle class are looking for, the goodies in life. And there was the Romantic movement and then the Oxford movement in a religious sense reacted against that. Um, it celebrated not, uh, not new industry and, and new uh, wealth, but the Middle Ages, uh, the time of faith, uh, rather than of rational calculation. A time of spirit rather than a time of material accumulation. So there was a kind of a, this is an anti-movement, and anti to that. And, and it's also uh, immediately inspired by the fact that that middle class was gaining political control in England and it was, they were changing the church, they were diminishing the church. One of the first things they did was they rationally calculated that the church had too many bishops and uh, they started to reduce the number of bishops. And they started to re they disestablish the church, the Church of England, in, non uh, in, in places outside of England. It was already disestablished, more or less, in Scotland, but the next was Ireland. So they, they disestablished the church in Ireland. Well, it, but they started to move in that direction. And uh, it looked like you know, this, this crass, materialistic, secular-minded middle class was uh, threatening. That was the 1830s, and that was the Oxford Movement. And this reinforces uh, the high church tendencies in the United States as well. So it was, now we're getting to our real theme here, the abolitionist movement. So it was that, of course, the Southern Episcopalians were evangelical, more evangelically minded. Uh, and in fact, we even started to evangelize the slaves in their own states, or in the South, uh, in their own section of the South. 
of course, were for obvious reasons not interested in the abolition movement. <laughs> the Northerners, who might be interested in the abolition movement, and many Episcopalians were abolitionists, no question about it, tended to be more of a high